Hi everyone, we'll get started here in just a minute. Give folks a chance to join. Okay, looks like we've got a good group joining us, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Kaya Swift. I'm the marketing director here at Heller Consulting. And today's topic is Microsoft Paths for Nonprofits. Before we get started, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. All attendee lines have been muted to ensure high quality audio. Today's webinar will run until 2 p.m. Eastern time and a recording will be sent to you tomorrow. And finally, thank you to those who have submitted questions already. If you have a question that comes up during today's conversation, please post that in the chat. I will be monitoring it throughout and I will try to get to all of them in the Q&A session at the end of today's hour. And with that, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce the guests that we have today. The first person I'm gonna introduce is Andy, who is the Head of Technology and Transformation at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Um, Andy, we're so excited to have you here today. If you could please tell us a little bit about yourself and the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Hi, uh, I'm Andy Cycle. Um, I am uh, with the Greater Chicago Food Depository. I uh, have been uh, with the Food Depository since 2019. Uh, prior to that, I spent uh, almost 30 years in consulting in corporate America and uh, decided I wanted to spend this point in my career in something more mission focused. And I was welcomed by the leadership team at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. So I'm really happy to be there. Um, as my title implies, I'm head of technology and transformation. And the reason for that transformation part of the title is we're really trying to embrace data and systems to make our work better, more effective than we have in the past. And we all know that um, there's, there's lots of examples of organizations trying to use systems in different ways, but not necessarily getting the benefit that they uh, intended out of those things. And so the transformation journey is really about people, process, and technology, and how we use the data. And so that's really kind of the focus of my role. Really happy to be here with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Andy, and we'll be back to you in just a moment. Um, we're also joined today by Aaron, who is the Global Director of Product Development for Microsoft Tech for Social Impact. Aaron, thank you for being here. Could you please tell us a little bit more about your role and the work you were doing at TSI? I'd love to, and just so excited to be here with uh, both Heller and Andy and his team today. I'm Erin McHugh-Safe. As you mentioned, I lead our efforts around Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit, and I have the honor of leading our engineering, product management, and user design experience teams within Tech for Social Impact. I have spent um, over 20 years uh, building products uh, across both the nonprofit and the commercial space, uh, largely uh, focused on building uh, user-based experiences that organizations um, can really use to transform their business operations, better use data, and really have a more efficient way of spending more time on their programs and missions. And uh, with that, I, the, my passion for being here at Microsoft um, and working with this team uh, grows by the day. Uh, as Andy mentioned, so much of the opportunity uh, in the sector today um, and continuing continuing forward um, is around how we are enabling the technology that nonprofit workers and their supporters will use today, um, but also over the coming decades. And so excited about the conversation today. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Erin. And uh, finally, I'm joined by two members of Team Heller today. Uh, we have with us Jeffrey, who is our CEO, and Jet, who is our Director of Business Development. We'll be hearing more from Jeffrey later, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Jet. Thank you so much, Kaya. Um, for our agenda today, I'll be sharing a little information to put the conversation with Andy and Aaron into a better context. Um, I'm gonna start out with some brief background on 
how Microsoft has been changing the technology landscape for nonprofits from our perspective here at Eller Consulting. Um, I'll share uh, some of our technology selection methodology that we've developed to help our clients navigate the options in the marketplace. Uh, I'll give a high level overview of the process that we participated in with Andy and the Greater Chicago Food Depository in order to select a platform. Uh, and then I'll turn the conversation uh, back over to Jeffrey, Andy, and Aaron, where we will spend most of today's time. Um, so, you know, Heller has a philosophy around technology that has driven our approach as an agency for the last 25 years. And that's that when there are more options in the market, nonprofits win. That's why uh, uh, we've developed a agnostic strategy and implementation practice uh, to help nonprofits evaluate and select tools and put them in place. Um, now, Microsoft has been a leading provider of technology to nonprofits for a long time. But we're now seeing them create nonprofit focused solutions for things like fundraising and programs, which is really providing new options for nonprofits to consider. Their focused attention to the sector, including establishing the nonprofit common data model and tools for fundraising and volunteers and marketing and programs has really given meaningful alternatives to some of the other platforms and systems in the marketplace. Uh, and we at Heller are now seeing more of our clients choose to base their technology ecosystems with Microsoft. And that's a big change from even a few years ago. So with more options in the market though, it can sometimes feel overwhelming to evaluate all of those options. And so that's why we've been leading our clients through a process that uh, helps determine if a platform approach to building a technology ecosystem is right for them, and if so, which platform is the best fit, and then ultimately determine which solutions to implement as part of that ecosystem. So for that process, you know, first we conduct a discovery process to understand the current business processes and needs. And because the purpose of making a change in technology is to you know, solve some pain points, do our current work better, but also to achieve new things, we wanna conduct more discovery to really make sure those requirements are future looking and ensure that those requirements align with the overall goals of the organization. We then work together to prioritize those requirements and ensure that we focus the evaluation effort on the most important aspects. Next, we help our clients develop a technology strategy and determine if a best in class point solution approach where you're managing integrations and data between systems is a good fit, or if the organization should select a foundational platform like Microsoft to build that ecosystem of tools around. And if that platform approach is appropriate, we help determine which platform is best suited to our clients' needs, you know, based on their business processes, budgets, and, and other things like that. With that technology strategy in place and a platform selected, then we can identify the specific tools, customizations, licensing that all need to be a part of that solution and will ultimately support all of the requirements. We saw this process play out with the food depository. Uh, we started with cross-departmental discovery that really sought to understand the needs of the organization from fundraising to volunteering and marketing and programs. And then by prioritizing those requirements and looking across various systems and platforms, uh, the food depository was able to identify Microsoft as that foundational technology platform on which to build an ecosystem of tools that would all work together. Uh, and finally, uh, they've been able to begin selecting and implementing those tools, knowing that they would all integrate well into that single ecosystem. So I'm excited to hear more from Andy and Aaron about that journey and about those tools. And so with that, I'll turn the floor over to our CEO, uh, Jeffrey, so he can help lead that discussion. Great. Thanks for setting us up for the conversation, Jet and Kaya. Uh, welcome, Andy. Uh, you're going to be the first person from which we have some questions with today. Uh, so let's start with what prompted the selection efforts for the food depository? What challenges were you facing and why did you decide to go through a technology selection process? Yeah, um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, back up a little bit and talk about who is the food depository because I think uh, as, as we did introductions, I probably didn't uh, didn't hit that quite enough. Um, the food deposit, the Greater Chicago Food Depository, is the food bank in Chicago. We're part of the Feeding America network uh, across North America, um, and we are uh, we work closely with about 700 
community organizations to really help our neighbors that are experiencing food insecurity uh, in the Chicago area. Um, and our mission is to end hunger. And our mission to end hunger is a big, complex mission. And that we'll we'll touch on that, I know, during this conversation. But uh, you know, now to get to your question, you know, kind of why why did we do the technology selection and how did we get to Microsoft um, you know, as a direction? When I came to the food depository, one of the first things we did was we we looked at what are the technology needs across the organization. We looked at every department. Um, we looked at where are their gaps, where are their inefficiencies, and uh, not surprisingly, um, we found that there was a lot of opportunity. And we really talked about how can we get better and use data more effectively. And that idea about using data more effectively was particularly challenging in the as-is landscape. If you just kind of paint the picture simply, if we have 10 departments, we have 10 different applications. And each of those applications has its own data model and there's really not much integration between them and so that's kind of the environment that um has has been in place for some time and i think that uh it's a fairly simple environment to stand up and to maintain and we didn't have a big um kind of it staff and we didn't really have a senior leader that was focused on how do we get to a better place the problems that came forward, the things that people asked about were, we'd really like to connect the dots across departments and across applications more. But starting from a place where you know each department's application is unique and wasn't built on you know a, a common data structure or, or model um, really made that challenging. So I think it was, we recognized the departmental inefficiencies, um, we saw a lot of opportunities to, to make that better. I'll give you a simple example. I mentioned that we have over 700 partners that we work with, and there are a variety of programs that our partners run that assist our um, community members. We didn't have one single place where all those partners and those programs are recorded. We have many of them in our ERP system, because our ERP system facilitates us moving food into the, into the community. But not every program that we support has food. For instance, benefits enrollment is a super important part of what we do. Benefits enrollment, we don't move food to those partners. They are doing that work digitally. But they were not included in one common uh, repository of all of our partners and programs. So it gives you a sense of, okay, that's the kind of disconnected um, set of systems and data that, that we had. And so we, we started looking at solving this problem is really gonna require looking at things pretty holistically. I'll give one other example. If you think about the supporters, the Greater Chicago Food Depository is um, an organization that has tremendous community support. We have, hundreds of thousands of people that donate to us and we are so thankful for that and that's what makes this organization work we have tens of thousands of people that come through our doors every year and volunteer with us and really help us move food into the community um, we have thousands of people that volunteer their time and their efforts in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, what what people know as a food drive has really migrated from a physical food drive to much more peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, a virtual food drive environment. So I take those three examples, and then I think about what are the systems and, and how do we track that um, in our environment today? Those things are all pretty separate, but those are many times the same people could participate in all three of those things. Or maybe someone participates in one of those things and doesn't know about the others. And so we wanna do a better job of engaging our supporters across all of the various ways that they can help us on our mission to end hunger. And so that just keeps coming back to this idea that we want a platform, we want a data model that will connect the dots across all of the work that we do. And we, you know, we don't have that today. So we really um, set out to, to say, let's, let's now go pick a platform and and envision the future where we can do those things and then that um you know kind of getting back to your question jeffrey was uh let's go look at the marketplace let's understand what are the options because there are lots of food banks out there we talked to many many of our 
um, peer food banks heard what they're doing. And we're really looking for what, what solution will get us to that place that we want to get to and, and kind of what has the best um, track record maybe of, of demonstrating that. So Jeffrey, I'll pause there. I know that was a long answer, but it gives a, a sense of you know kind of where we started from. No, that was great. It was really good to hear the backstory and and the specific examples uh, that you folks were were considering. Um, so we went through this process with you. Uh, you and the team eventually selected Microsoft as your platform to build upon. There's a lot of good options out there. You looked at many of those. Uh, how come you ended up choosing Microsoft? Yeah, to be honest, when I started this journey, I was new to the nonprofit space. I had talked to a bunch of my, um, like I said, kind of peers in the in the food bank network and um i didn't find that microsoft was the most common choice amongst uh the the folks that you know were out doing similar work and so i didn't immediately think that this would be where we landed but i certainly wanted to look at the marketplace holistically um i also recognized that um we were uh, we're certainly not the first ones to take on this challenge and so you know us really getting serious about this and engaging in this um, lots of people had been down this road. So uh, we looked at the options and we looked at them you know, very seriously and we um, talked to references from the various uh, you know, kind of options that we looked at. And I'll tell you um, the, probably the, the, at the end of the day, the reason that we landed on Microsoft, to start with, we are a Microsoft organization already. We use Office, we use Teams. The ERP system that I talked about is based on Microsoft Nav. Um, we run you know, some on-premise applications on Windows Server. So as the head of technology, I think about the skill sets that we wanna maintain, and we already need and have a good amount of Microsoft knowledge and skills. And so that made sense to me. Um, so that was you know, kind of one starting point. I think the next piece, and you heard me talk a lot about data when I talked about the problem, Microsoft's commitment to a common data model really, really is foundational for us and really, I think, differentiates what Microsoft is doing in building solutions um, that I think will make our solving that problem I talked about easier for us over time. I'll give you some examples of that. But, um, you know, as we engage with Microsoft and they explained, what is the common data model that they use across industries to build solutions? And then what are the industry specific data models like the nonprofit common data model? We saw those things as fundamental to getting our technology landscape right. And so that was a huge part of why we believe the Microsoft solution you know, was the right solution. And then I think within the Microsoft solution landscape, you have multiple technology providers that you can partner with and and as you know we are we are a sizable nonprofit but we are still a nonprofit organization i have a history in corporate america where we had huge it teams we don't have a huge it team in the nonprofit space what i really want is i want vendors that are really strong in helping us with our technology so that we have we have technologists at the food depository that really focus on the business processes that are unique to food banking. And then we can use partners to help us with the technology that is common across industries, you know, like at the at the Microsoft Office and Windows level. And then even within the industry of food banking, um, you know, like our ERP is shared across many different uh, food banks. And so therefore having a good vendor network behind us is important and therefore the Microsoft ecosystem is strong. There's a strong you know, base of partners there. So I think those are probably um, the biggest reasons why Microsoft made sense to us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we often talk about the differences between products, solutions, and platforms. Andy, can you explain the benefit you've seen from first selecting the platform and then moving on to a CRM roadmap project? Yeah, and I, I probably, uh, you know, touched on that there. Um, we thought about that ecosystem that we were gonna live in. We know that uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem, the fact that Microsoft has defined a common data model, what that means is we can get solutions directly from Microsoft, but we can also get those solutions through third parties, partners of Microsoft that are in the network. And even third party software developers can develop 
solutions that will integrate with the Microsoft Common Data Model. That was important to us because um, we felt like, uh, well, I'll give you an example. We were looking for a volunteering application and we happened to choose a volunteer application that was not the Microsoft application, but is a vendor, Golden, that is in the Microsoft ecosystem. We really like the, the solution that Golden brings forward and we love the fact that the Golden solution for volunteer uh, management that we're using integrates with the Microsoft CRM so that that idea about donors and volunteers and peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers, all that data comes together for us in our CRM. So um, that was kind of critical as we thought about the ecosystem gives us a set of options, but those options are not a single option. We can play within that ecosystem and have things that fit together nicely. And then we can pick vendors that have the right amount of support. And so as we thought about um, our CRM and moving to a Microsoft-based CRM, the technology was important to us, but also having a vendor that could really be a strong support vendor, as I talked about a few minutes ago. I've, I've talked to many of my peers, and sometimes when people jump into the CRM space, they end up adding a number of headcount to their IT staff because keeping up with the product and the product releases and the product enhancements and all of the um, configuration and getting the data model right, that can be a pretty big job. And so as we looked at this, we, we decided we like where Microsoft is, we like the roadmap that Microsoft has, but we also want a strong partner that's gonna help us manage those things. And we'll limit the number of headcount that we have to have on staff at the Food Depository, but will not limit our ability to stay plugged in to the Microsoft roadmap and all the investments that come from Microsoft. So all those things kind of came together for us to say, let's pick the platform, we'll know that ecosystem that we're playing in, and then let's look at products. And sometimes those products will come directly from Microsoft and sometimes they'll come from third parties, but then we can make the choices that we wanna make, but still have a solution landscape that is based off of a common data model and that will get us to a place where we will not have 10 departments with 10 different applications that don't have integrated data. We will then start to live in a world where our departments will have applications that are optimized for their business function, but the data model will come together in the back, and then we'll be able to see data across departments the way we, we really want to. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you. And I think my last question for now, uh, before we go to Aaron, and I think you just partly answered this question, but what do you anticipate will be the biggest impact of this technology change? So this is a journey for us. We know when we started this, this is a, this is a multi-year journey. Um, I said, as we talked about the food depository, our mission is to end hunger. That's a big complex mission, we know that, and we're not gonna do that alone. Um, and it speaks to the need for us to elevate our game understand our partners and their strengths and the relationships that exist in this community so that we can do things tomorrow that we can't do today. I think the inefficiencies that we have today consume much of our time. We wanna build a set of business practices on top of a strong uh, technology stack that gets rid of some of the inefficiencies and starts to use data and automation in ways that we don't today. And then that's gonna free us up to do things that we can't do today or don't have time to do today. So we're gonna learn from our partners. We're gonna use the data, collect data, see what it tells us, and then figure out what is the next best thing that we can do. So whether that's working with supporters and trying to nudge supporters to the next best action that we think helps us you know, move the ball toward, toward ending hunger, or just understanding our partners more and figuring out how do all of these individual community organizations that do um, amazing work helping our community, how do we become a better partner for them? I think it elevates our game. And that's really, that's really the, the journey that we're on. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, I have a few questions uh, for you now. Absolutely. Um, so we heard Andy talk a little bit about the, the CRM roadmap process once they've selected Microsoft. We know there are many different options available for organizations within the Microsoft ecosystem. Can you please explain uh, Microsoft's approach to developing, seeding, and supporting a thriving nonprofit ecosystem? 
Absolutely, and great to be here, Andy. I uh, love your words of wisdom, and I'll, I'll try to refer back to a few of, uh, of your comments that really stick out for why we're on this journey and, and so excited to partner with organizations like yours. Uh, but to your question, Jeffrey, um, there, there are a tremendous a number of opportunities across the Microsoft platform. And I loved the way Andy described their journey of, of um, leveraging data and that being a key and critical goal uh, and focus area for them, as well as your comment about connecting the dots across your organization and across the different workloads that your team members are managing and even to inspiring your supporters and getting to know your supporters better. Um, that is very much how we think about the platform opportunities that organizations can take advantage on. Um, we have uh, something you'll hear me talk about here called Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit. Uh, this is our platform of uh, purposeful, purposefully built uh, nonprofit capabilities uh, that fundraisers, marketers, um, program officers, and others across the organization um, can begin to leverage as it fits with the goals that they have, just like Andy described. And many organizations are leveraging a subsets of our productivity tools, are leveraging um, our Azure data infrastructure capabilities depending on their needs. So there are many different ways to engage in the platform tools and technology uh, depending on the organization's needs. And it's never a one size fits all approach and so you know what we're looking to do is really build a common set of tools a common set of applications that have uh, the widest use and the widest value across the, the areas of commonality across organizations we often talk about this as our commitment to the sector in the form of a nonprofit value map um, really oriented to, to the jobs to be done that the organization is looking to match to um, to technology and uh, that is is a really important way that we partner with both organizations and our partner ecosystem to help meet organizations where they are. Uh, the other way that we're a bit different is that we partner with an immense partner ecosystem that are focused on helping go very, very deep um, to help enable technology um, that the organization comes to them with. This is critically important. Uh, we're serving both organizations and a rich partner ecosystem and really looking in both cases to help bring down the overall cost of research and development for that partner ecosystem, as well as the overall uh, total cost of ownership that organizations themselves have to invest in and put forth as they explore how to modernize their technology stacks. Um, and we stay focused really in four key areas, um, helping organizations know their donors and supporters, um, helping organizations to develop and deliver more effective um, program delivery, helping organizations through data insights and reporting to accelerate their mission outcomes and doing all of that with the um, critical tools for data and application security. Uh, you'll hear me talk a few times today about security and the importance of that. Great. Well, going a bit deeper in to your partners, can you please provide details on the value of the partner ecosystem and how nonprofits can work with partners to adopt solutions? Absolutely. Um, this has one, been uh, one of the most tremendous parts of being at Microsoft is being part of this broader ecosystem. It's every day I'm struck by the number of companies across the globe that are investing in the nonprofit industry. It's, it's incredible. Um, and we have partners that uh, go very, very deep in helping organizations in a particular geography. 
We have organizations and partners that are very uh, specifically focused on verticals or sub-vertical niches, um, mission types that the organization might uh, serve. And we have uh, partners that certainly have a horizontal approach to the tools and the applications they build. And we felt um, as Tech for Social Impact is, is coming up to its five-year anniversary, the way that we started all of this um, very purposefully was to think about how can we build a foundation, a data foundation, as Andy talked about, that enables those partners to build from common building blocks and accelerate their own investment into the sector, but also help organizations at the same time be able to invest in a platform that will grow with them and a platform where that data layer, that data foundation is something that they can leverage for their own purposes but also choose best of breed applications depending on their needs. And this is critical. Um, I have never met a nonprofit over my 20 plus years of working in this sector who have applications on a single platform. Now we hope to deliver the value on our platform um, to make those easy decisions, especially over time. But organizations always have a best of breed set of capabilities that they may need to keep in place that are mission critical. And our job really is to build the connective tissue and the building blocks to help those integrations be easier over time, where the data and the insights we can learn from data gets better and better, and to do that in a cost-effective way. That doesn't take a, a, a massive overhaul of every application under the sun, which is just not practical, it's not affordable, and it's really not feasible. Um, so that's what you know, gets us excited and out of bed every morning thinking about these complex challenges of how do we build the right hooks into our platform to make it easier for organizations and the partners that serve them to be able to innovate. Great, thank you. Um, I've heard you talk before uh, about Microsoft's commitment to a philosophy of grow as you go. Can you please explain this philosophy? Sure, I'd love to. Um, I think this is again a, a something that is very, um, it, it gives me a lot of energy. I, I think what we have done with Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit is put together what we hope is a set of valuable applications, uh, packages and um, different solutions that organizations can leverage depending on where they are in their technology journey. And for some organizations that might be um, starting with a, a fundraising CRM or, um, or modernizing their current approach to fundraising CRM. And for other organizations that was um, having to completely transform their business overnight to run their whole team remotely um, and needing to leverage tools like Teams um, and, and leverage um, uh, the cloud in ways that they maybe hadn't been planning for that budget season. And so grow as you go means that everything under the umbrella of, of Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit and our company-wide three cloud strategy means you can make a set of choices about what technology you need to focus on right now. And the commitment from the company to our partners and to our customers is that we're going to be building all of the uh, the products and applications um, that we provide to the sector with that common data foundation, the common data model for nonprofits underneath all the applications. So that if you invest, for example, um, in a, a volunteer application or in our fundraising application, that if you have a need for program related applications in the future, those applications are gonna integrate. They're completely interoperable. They already talk to each other. The account and contact uh, entities and structure are the same. This becomes super important um, around areas like marketing. Uh, we share a common data foundation with our fundraising CRM and Dynamics 365 marketing. This becomes so important because there's an enormous team of engineers um, improving and developing that product. And we're able to uh, offer those capabilities to nonprofit partners and organizations um, by integrating um, those applications in a way that keeps um, the investment in a that initial uh, application uh, really moving forward so that organizations are able to benefit 
from a really um, deep set of investment that Microsoft as a company is making in this priority industry. Um, and that is, is super important. It also helps our engineering teams move faster as well, and those of our partners. Thank you, Erin. I have two final questions for our panelists. Uh, Andy, uh, starting with you, uh, final words of advice for nonprofit leaders who are looking to invest in their organization's technology? Mm, um, you know, this is a journey. I talked about that. And I think it's, um, you know, my, my years of experience are, it really is about people, process, and technology. It's not just about the technology. You can make a lot of mistakes if you focus on that too much. But you can really unlock benefits and, and um, new capabilities if you get the data right. And so I think this thinking about the journey, it'll take years to get you know, from where we are today to where we want to be. But you know, by, by thinking long-term, that's where we wanna be. That's, how, that's the data model that we wanna be on because that's gonna enable us to do things across departments. Um, in ways that we didn't in the past, couldn't in the past. You know, that's um, that's probably the the advice. Uh, you know, think long term about that data model, and don't just think about technology. It's got to be holistic about you know the people transformation. Yeah. Oh, great advice, Aaron. Any advice you have for nonprofits looking to start their journeys with uh, with Microsoft? I think we're we're ready to get started with you um, today. So I would start um, by visiting our website. There you can find a lot of information about um, all of the great wisdom that Andy shared today, as well as the applications that we have available for the organ for your organization, as well as ways to connect with our partner ecosystem. And so there's a treasure trove of information there. Um, I would also share that we have um, a tremendous, tremendous uh, philanthropies arm of the company. And so a big part of our business model is um, also providing uh, grants and discounted software and services across the global nonprofit sector. And you can find out more about ways to engage on, on that very critical philanthropic side of the business on the website as well. And we hope that there are ways that we can help um, both with your technology needs, but also potentially with um, philanthropic opportunities that might be a match for your mission. All right, thank you both. Uh, we will now be opening it up to questions from the audience. I'll turn it back over to Kaya to ask those questions. Wonderful, and thank you so much, Aaron and Andy. Um, we have several, several, several questions from the audience. We won't get to all of them, but um, I have quite a few for Andy. Um, <clears throat> Andy, the first one is, I had several variations of this question and it boils down to, uh, for you, what did Microsoft bring to the table that was different from Salesforce? Um, I would say the data model. When I when I talked to people that had been down the Salesforce road, I heard a lot of stories of trying to figure out the data model and and different pieces of the application landscape not necessarily integrating as easily as they had hoped, and the Microsoft Common Data Model, and that's really why I was talking about that, um, is I think, it, to me, it seems to be defined better such that multiple parties can develop to it and uh, minimize the work on us. And so, you know, that's sort of the promise of, of the Common Data Model from Microsoft and the vendors in that network. And so it was, um, as, as we, because we of course looked at Salesforce. I mean, uh, I would say Salesforce has first mover advantage in the nonprofit space for CRM. Um, but, but for us, trying to talk to our peers and find out how had that gone, it was hard to find um, maybe what I was hoping to find, which was you know a story of yeah, this came together nicely for us, and it wasn't a heavy as heavy of a lift for us. And so I think that's I think that's the fundamental you know piece for me. The other piece is, and I talked about this in in the why Microsoft. We already use Microsoft in so many places that continuing to build on Microsoft minimizes the number of skills I have to maintain in my IT organization. 
And so that just that just makes it easier for me as a nonprofit technology leader to say I can I can reduce the number of skill sets I have to maintain. Thank you, Andy. Um, on that staffing question, actually, somebody was asking too about um, how are you approaching staffing for this sort of digital transformation effort, if you have any advice around staffing or supporting your staff through something like this? Yeah, really good question. So um, my background before I came to the Food Depository was in consulting. And as I looked at the work that was ahead of us, it was very clear to me that we're going to go through a bunch of projects and each project is going to create incremental work. And then when that project is over, that incremental work goes away and you get back to kind of sustaining. And what that told me was there's going to be third party involvement for us. We're going to go find partners in the marketplace that are strong and that can help us through the project work. And then we'll get to a place where this is the staff that we need to sustain our, our you know, application landscape and, and you know, do, do the IT support function that, um, you know, that everybody has to do. So the way we are thinking about staffing, um, well, even preceding staffing, we went and developed, actually got some partners to help us, but developed a methodology for doing projects so that it became clear how do you do, how do you run a project successfully and how do i incorporate the appropriate change management into those projects so we developed the methodology then we staffed project managers and many of our project managers are contract project managers and they come in and they do a project or a couple of projects with us um and then we engage third parties and, and heller is a third party that we found when we had a particular project that needed you know a particular skill set and the first the first project we did with heller really had to do with um tuning up our gift processing in our current environment we were just we were way too manual and now we we're doing gift processing and so heller came in and we really re-engineered that space and i got to know jeffrey and his team and they have continued to help us through what we talked about here which is more of our platform selection but i think you know that core thing about staffing is i recognize that um we are for instance in the crm space i have a crm IT lead, then that person is going to be core in this project front to back so that, um, you know, she's really going to learn the, the application and be ready to support the business. But I also talked about our partner and we were careful in, in our partner selection. We're working with Stratus Live and Stratus Live will enable us to minimize our internal headcount because what they do is they focus on supporting nonprofits with the Microsoft CRM stack. and that's part of what we contracted with them so they are they are um a big part of the of course the project but also our long-term support and so i wanted to be sure that i had a partner that wasn't just going to do the project with me and go away i wanted a partner that was going to be with me long term and so that was all part of the thinking around how we are our staffing to be successful here thank you andy and um like you mentioned, um, Stratus Live, and um, we have several questions kind of talking about the different departments that you're bringing along in this technology transformation. Would you mind just kind of giving a brief overview of somebody's asking about, you know, are you doing fundraising as part of this transformation? Somebody else is asking, um, are you doing like wraparound services at the food depository um, yeah. does, you know, is that coming into the Microsoft ecosystem yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, um, good question. So. Um, we are absolutely doing fundraising you know we're doing our core development team and our marketing team um and uh our volunteer team i mentioned uh, golden we actually did that project uh already to stand up golden with our volunteer team but when we did the selection we knew the ecosystem that we were going to be in we knew we were going to be on the microsoft in the microsoft ecosystem and so that was you know, we made that selection and the timing happened to be um, first, but as we then, uh, we have not yet converted fundraising, but that project is underway and will convert in 2023. And when that converts, we will plug in our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, um, our volunteer management, and all of our marketing and uh, fundraising all, uh, you know, in that space a project we haven't tackled yet but is super important to what the work that we do is advocacy and so if you think about you know how we engage 
in changing policy to, you know, again, this mission to end hunger. We haven't tackled that area yet, but when we tackle it, we'll use the same principles, which, which are um, finding partners and solutions within the Microsoft ecosystem so that those solutions will um, play nicely in, you know, in the uh, environment that we're working in. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. I'll give you a little bit of a break because I have a question for Aaron here. Um, Aaron, we have a, a few people kind of asking, and you had mentioned this um, with, you know, grants and things that Microsoft offers, and um, but some questions around like the price or affordability and getting started. If you, um, one person says, we have seven different systems that need to go to one. <laughs> um, so, what would you suggest um, if people are in that very beginning process of um, determining uh, costs, evaluating costs and determining what they might need at their organization if they know, okay, we have seven different systems that are just not working for us and we are interested in Microsoft, um, what would you suggest as the starting point for them? It's a great question and it's such a fundamental part of the, of the journey um, to begin uh, choosing and selecting your path forward. Um, I would recommend uh, partnering uh, with uh, organizations like Heller uh, as you make those assessments. And I would encourage you to um, get engaged, you know, check out um, the Microsoft website. There you can get engaged with specialists who will help you start uh, making those ass assessments right away. Um, total cost of ownership, making sure our tools are affordable for the sector is a core part of our strategy. Um, we do get feedback. Um, um, and we have a, a, a thriving partner ecosystem that keeps us really honest <laughs> about how we're doing on this front. Um, and they provided recent feedback that um, th this is also a platform that's very affordable. Look, we're we're working and um, delivering technology value for the nonprofit sector. That means we have a responsibility to uh, ensure um, that this is an affordable path forward, um, so that you can plan now, but have staying power in the platform that you choose um, is critically important. And so, for many organizations, they're going to be able to take advantage of a wealth of different offers and discounts. For example, um, we provide um, Azure discounts, modern workplace discounts, Dynamics and Power Platform discounts um, across the board, um, uh, different discounts and offers around Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit for every application that we develop. And those options are, um, are pretty extensive and our specialists are be happy to make sure that those are really brought forward quickly um, so that you have a sense uh, for the overall cost of ownership. Um, so uh, follow up with uh, your industry consultants and follow up with our teams and we'll help get you started right away. Wonderful, thank you, Erin. Um, Andy, I have a question for you about um, communication throughout the project. Um, so you had talked about, you know, supporting your staff and um, how you're approaching staffing. Um, but do you have any advice around communicating throughout a large project like this? Um, and uh, yeah, said, so what's your biggest communication challenge right now um, as you're building out a large tech ecosystem? Uh, I would say that um, when I started this journey, we did this kind of IT needs assessment and, and what came out of that were a, a list of projects. And honestly, there were 50 projects probably on that list. And it was in total something we called the IT roadmap. And I um, shared that with the senior leadership team at the food depository. And we talked about, you know, I, I said, this is gonna take years to get done and in total cost millions of dollars. And I wasn't sure that the organization could take that on. I mean, I was new to the nonprofit space. And I was, you know, uh, the reaction that I got from our senior leadership team was, we haven't done this before, but we see that you have. And we we will figure out how to budget for this. We, you know, the fact that it's, it's um, gonna take years to do, it, you know, is good because it gives us time to work through the, the funding for that. And I tell that story to say communication here started at the very highest level. And we presented that story to the board. So the board was on board, you know, with, with what we're doing. And so from the very beginning, we've had really good senior support. And then with that senior support, um, 
I give an update once a month to that senior leadership team on exactly where we are across the active projects. We, you know, as I said, there were probably 50 projects on that list and we've finished some and we have some in process at, you know, at any given time. And so there's just a, there's regular, I think, good awareness about what's happening. But then within any project, and this really gets at the project methodology, in the very first phase of a project, you have to identify all of your stakeholders. And that's one of the things we're, we've tried to be very disciplined about is identify all the stakeholders and come up with an appropriate communication plan. And so in the first phase of any change management journey, you have to have awareness. And so you have to know who all those people are and they have to understand the why of why are we doing these things. And so um, that communication started at the most senior level but then at the project level affects, you know, individuals in a, in a department, across departments, you know, just the, the very specific people that are going to be engaged in that project. And then we try and keep that communication going, of course, throughout the whole project to make sure that we are successful at getting the successful change adopted by our people. Um, so that's, you know, probably more words than, <laughs> than, than the uh, person might have been asking, but uh, that's, you know, Communication has just got to be fundamental to making sure everyone understands what we're doing, why we're doing it, and we have the right level of support um, to be successful with the change. Absolutely. Yeah, we've, yeah, that's absolutely critical. Um, it's wonderful advice. Thank you, Andy. Um, and Andy, I'm going to stick with you. I'm sorry, we have lots of questions for you. Um, but somebody's asking about data governance. Um, have you established sort of a data governance plan for this project? Um, do you have sort of one source of data truth across the project or across the organization? Yeah, great, great question. So I didn't talk about we are building a data warehouse and we're using you know azure data factory and azure devops and power bi like we're, we're sticking with the microsoft platform as we build our our data warehouse and what we're doing with the data warehouse um we're we're taking a use case and so we're, we have a specific use case that is our first use case and we're standing that up and as we introduce data to the data warehouse we are looking upstream to see what is the source systems for that data and looking at data governance there. When we first put our IT roadmap project together, there was a project on there and it talked about standing up a data maintenance organization and, and data governance and trying to make that a project. And I hesitated to launch that project because the business outcome of that project is a little bit hard to justify. I think everybody who knows technology and data knows that that's important. But what we're what we're really trying to do is say, as we take on projects, we are looking at the data governance for those what I call enterprise data elements and making sure we get those in place. And as we tackle each individual project, we are getting the data stewards and the data governance stood up for those functions. What I think will happen actually in this, probably in the next 12 months, we have, we've done some brainstorming on what does an analytics and data governance function look like at the food depository. And so we've, we've drafted that, but we haven't staffed it. Some of the staffing of that are people that are already here because we have people that kind of informally do some of that work but some of that will be incremental staffing. And so I think as we get deeper into our project roadmap, there just comes a time when, it, when you really have to formalize that into one central organization. So it's a great question. I don't know that we're doing it the best, of, you know, the best way, but I'm telling you the way we're thinking about it. We're trying to tackle it project by project and, and likely this year we will centralize that so we get better centralized data governance and stewardship practices you know in one place but that'll be federated across the departments because much of the data is managed in those departments and so um yeah it's finding that right balance between central and, and federated i think absolutely um aaron i have a, a question for you you had mentioned security as being a, a top priority um so just general curiosity from some folks about um you know, why is security, why should security be top of mind um, for nonprofits and what is uh, Microsoft doing to support that um, through the nonprofit specific solutions that you're developing? 
Absolutely. Um, it, you know, continues to be just a, such an important time. It, it always has been uh, such an important time um, for organizations to take stock of their own infrastructure and application uh, layers uh, to ensure that their data um, and that their applications are secure. And of course, the world over continues um, to see so many challenging um, scenarios and, and so much targeting of the nonprofit industry with bad actors um, operating across the globe. Um, and so taking stock of uh, your organization's current state and, and developing a plan of action uh, with partners um, to, and, you know us everyone here represented on the call um, and and developing um, peer relationships um, to be able to ensure that your organization is aligning to best um, security standards is critically important how we're helping with that um, we provide security assessments to organizations um, across the sector so again uh, check out the website there are ways to um, get started with that right away and our team would be happy to help it's critically critically important and then with our own um, product development efforts we as part of um, Microsoft uh, as a first party engineering team have to ascribe to the highest level of compliance standards um, to meet the ability to launch products into this industry and so what that means um, is we really focus in five key areas uh, we focus on accessibility, on data privacy, on data security, on global readiness, um, and uh, all in all, you know, that relates to our uh, software development lifecycle and our, um, our standards of security, um, disaster recovery, uh, our BCDR programs, and to meet the bar at the company is quite, quite extensive um, and requires um, a serious commitment of investment. So what that can assure you as a nonprofit organization, when you're leveraging a Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit product, that product has to meet very, very expressly um, uh, diligent standards um, in order to be part of that umbrella. And that is the difference uh, with partners that are investing in building from Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit as opposed to some of our other um, assets like um, the Nonprofit Accelerator. First party product from Microsoft um, that partners are building on has to meet the highest level of security and standards and comes back with technical support, uh, technical support provided by um, by our teams. So, um, let, you know, if you need help in this area, I would recommend getting started with a security assessment and progressing down that path. Wonderful information. Thank you, Erin. Um, we are about here at the top of the hour, so I am going to do a wrap up here. Um, thank you all for those wonderful questions um, for those that submitted ahead of time and for those of you who put them in the question box here throughout the conversation. Thank you so much for those. Um, and uh, I will say a quick plug for the nonprofit resources that we have over at teamheller.com. We have nonprofit specific guides, blogs, and more. So please be sure to check that out. And um, there's also several links in the chat um, from Aaron and the Microsoft team um, for you to go and explore um, if you're interested in getting started with Microsoft solutions at your nonprofit. Um, but that is it for our webinar today. Like I said, a recording will be sent out to all of you tomorrow. Thank you again, Aaron and Andy for being here today and answering all of our questions. Thank Pleasure. you, team. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.